Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning to those that are uh, here this morning and good morning to everyone at home. I heard a, a, an unfortunate hiccup ha happened last week with our recorded service, our live stream service. There was a technology problem. We, we're getting used to those, aren't we? But uh, so apologies to everybody who is listening at home, whether you're tuned in again this week or whether you've decided to give up and come here. <laughs> we, <laughs> the, the problem has been solved, Loris. Yeah. Oh, good, good. The problem has been solved. I've been assured that our, our tech crew are, are really working very, very hard. And um, these hiccups happen from time to time, but we do apologize for that. And, uh, but that's the bad news. The good news is that it's fixed, but extra good news, just letting everyone know that our favorite little Lego parables that we see from time to time have been um, uploaded separately to YouTube, our YouTube tra tra channel, sorry, our YouTube channel. So if you just want to tune into the Lego <laughs> parable, <laughs> you can do that. So uh, we're not having one as part of the service today, but when the service is over, if you're at home, you can look up all those parables and have a good time watching those. So um, that's just a little bit of news for the kids before they go out to pond, but also for everybody who enjoys the hard work of those, those Lego creation. We've come this morning, whether uh, on our uh, online at home, or whether here in the building, we've come this morning to praise our God. Lovely to see you. Oh, there you go. Got a bit of down happening. Um, first off, I just want to acknowledge the good work that uh, the maintenance team did yesterday. I had a bit of a wander around this morning, and you can see the, the evidence of the garden slowly being reclaimed after COVID and uh, some work at the front garden here near the door. So well done to all those that uh, contributed their time and energy and hope that uh, it went very well. I actually intended to come, but my bike didn't go when I went to leave home and the starter motor got stuck on and I was running around like a headless chook trying to stop it. I had to disconnect the battery. And so it's what happens when you ride old motorcycles. You, You've got to keep the maintenance up. So I spent my time running around getting parts for that. Um, but anyway, it was uh, really nice to come here this morning and see that work taking place. And, it, and it's interesting, isn't it? We, we're slowly getting back some of the rhythm and, and, and it takes a little while, doesn't it? It takes a little while. As we uh, come to the Lord's table and reflect on our present theme with the Lenten series, this idea of lament and compassion. Now, the word compassion is something familiar for us, isn't it? In terms of, uh, it's a word that gets used often in, term, in terms of our faith expression and experiencing God's mercy and engagement with us. But the word lament, it's, it's an old word that you don't hear used much. Certainly it doesn't engage with uh, our secular society. Um, so I thought I'd just read three verses from Lamentations, uh, chapter one, just the first three of the book. And, and I think it's a good grounding to embracing this idea of what lament is all about. How deserted lies the city once so full of people. How like a, a widow is she, who once was great among the nations. She who was a queen among the provinces, has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. After affliction and harsh labour, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells amongst the nations. She finds no resting place. All her all who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. And so it goes on. Ooh, it's very uncomfortable, isn't it? 
One of the challenges, particularly in a society where anything goes and, uh, you know, what, who, who sets the rules of what values are, we don't like sitting with the uncomfortable stuff. And this idea of lamenting, you know, the book of Lamentations is, is a sustained expression of grief and pain. And the author personifies Jerusalem as a woman who mourns her desolation in the imagery of imposing, jarring, tragic way. But this idea that of sitting and taking some ownership and sitting with the grief and the, and the bitterness of, of what hasn't worked in our lives can be the foundation for restoration and experiencing God's compassion. So we don't want to go back to those places that don't work. Um, sometimes they're big dramatic experiences. But really, I think the challenge for all of us, as a mate of mine used to say when he used to get up and speak, Christ is easy in life. It's the ordinary that's hard. And, and I'd stop and think about it and I'd go, yeah, it's in the ordinary about how I engage with my wife or my children or my neighbours or my extended crazy family that drives me nuts and infuriating at times. I'm probably a bit that way for them, I guess. And so it's just working out. What are the things that I do that, that I take ownership of, that I lament about, that are unhelpful in those relationships? that actually don't contribute in a healthy way, that don't show grace, don't show mercy. And one of the things that I do well that I can celebrate, I go, I need to do more of that. So with that, it's something to ponder as you come to break bread, this regular sacred act that we do. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to have your... Uh, communion ready if you have it with you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is right that we call to mind the meaning of the Lord's Supper. It is the remembrance of the cross, encounter of the risen Lord, communion with one another and an anticipation of his coming. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you, how the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took some bread and gave thanks and he broke it. And saying, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. So as often as you drink it, do this in memory of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, as we, uh, as we are about to partake of this wonderful, powerful, symbolic, spiritual encounter meal, we pray, Lord, that... Um, you will challenge us about the little things that maybe need to change in the way we engage with people around us, that we actually own, lament the things that need to change. And we pray, Lord, that we can, uh, through discernment, through reflection, through prayer, find a better way to express our transformation, our discipleship in you. In Jesus' name. This is the body of Christ broken to you. Take and eat. This is Christ's blood shed for you. Let's drink together.
Thank you, everyone. And I'll invite Alistair up, who's going to lead us um, in some prayers, but also make a few announcements. Thanks, Alistair. Morning, everyone. So my name is Alistair. I'm an elder here at Living Faith Church. And we're going to enter into a, a time of prayer for the church and for the world. Dear Lord, one of my one of my biblical heroes seems so apt in this time. He sat outside the city gates, cooking food on a fire made from his own dung. It was disgusting. He knew it. And the point was that the city was disgusting. But maybe it didn't know it. And so I come to you with the joint realization that we are, we are absolutely loved and precious. But also maybe we don't treat that preciousness so well. And so I ask that you open our eyes, that we can see the, we can see what is so obvious to you. The way we talk about people as trash, the, the way we, we prefer to hide from injustice rather than confront it. But also just how amazingly precious we are, how everyone, both predator and prey, are beloved in your eye. That no one is trash to you and that everything will be brought out into the light. And so I thank you. I thank you for your continued assurance of our value, for every step you've made to reinforce that point over and over again, that we are loved. And I ask that we can live up to that value. Amen. So we'll come into some community news. We have some notices. So we come up to Easter. It's pretty exciting. There'll be uh, we've got a couple of dates up there to remind you about various events. In particular, we've got uh, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and of course, the day we celebrate that God wins Easter. And we'll just click on to the next. Oh, I was supposed to highlight because it's not in, in getting connected that the ecumenical service was cancelled. Um, there's an update to church directory. Uh, if your details have changed since 2019, if they were incorrect in the previous one, and so maybe they changed sometime earlier, um, please let Joan and Brian know. They do a stellar effort, but they need everyone to come together. And finally, we've got the Lion King coming up from the Diamond Valley Singers. Uh, it's a good opportunity to get together, to uh, listen to some music, and maybe think about uh, past, past joys. I'm not sure exactly when The Lion King first came out, but uh, it's old enough now that it will make you feel really old when you look it up. Cool. I think that's it. There you go. If you want to connect with us, uh, send us an email to welcome at livingfaithchurch.org.au. If you're equally, if you're um, like to know more about what's happening with Pond and with the uh, with the kids ministry, also send an email and I'll include you in the uh, regular email that goes out. Thanks, everyone. The Bible reading is from the book of John, chapter 11 and verses 32 to 37. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, 
Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Good morning, everyone. Here and at home. Welcome today. Uh, we're looking at, as Vic mentioned before, uh, lament and compassion. And we're looking at it uh, through a different lens uh, today. And part of the reason is because we're asking ourselves the question about our own compassion. And I've often heard of compassion fatigue. What is that? How does it come about? How do we lose our appetite for loving other people? Um, how do we look at ourselves as human beings? And is it normal just to have compassion fatigue? Uh, is it acceptable in God's sight? Should we feel guilty about it? Uh, how do we deal with it? It's a reality because the issues of, that face us in life are endless. They continue. And um, how do we deal with that in our own lives? How do we do that? deal with that as a Christian? And so we're coming today to have a look at the very first bit of the passage, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And I'm going to ask you a question. Why did Jesus weep? Why did Jesus weep? Now, this may seem um, a bit of an obvious question. Well, I, I mean, he was there and Lazarus had died and everybody was sad, so he was sad too. Is that, but how does the story go? See, the story is that Jesus was actually a couple of days away journey when he heard that uh, Lazarus was ill. The message was sent to him by Mary and Martha. And uh, he was very fond of this family, two, brother, uh, two sisters and a brother. And uh, every year when he went to Passover in Jerusalem, because, of course, remember, Jesus did most of his ministry up north in Galilee, he'd stop by and say hello. So uh, he was obviously, um, you know, deeply connected with uh, this family. Um, but when he heard from um, Mary, I think, or Martha, that, uh, Beth, that Lazarus was ill, uh, he said to his disciples, and I quote, he said, um, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that the God's son may be glorified through it. And so he waited two more days before he headed off to Bethany. So uh, Jesus um, uh, said, uh, this is happening so for God's glory so God's son may be glorified through it. So clearly he knew what was going to happen. This it was unfolding in his own mind that Lazarus was going to die and it was he was going to bring him back from death and there would be such an opportunity to, for people to realise that the Messiah had mastery over death. And he said this in his teaching. Um, and uh, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So there's this whole event, basically, Jesus has orchestrated. So why did Jesus weep? He knew it was going to have a happy ending. It's like watching a Hollywood movie and you know that, you know, it's going to turn out okay. He will get there in time with the medicine. They will get, the car will get to the airport before she leaves on the plane. It's that sort of story. So why did Jesus weep? Perhaps it was because, you know, Lazarus was dying. But Jesus himself was going to die seven days later. And Jesus knew that as well. That was why he went to Jerusalem. He made it plain to his disciples that that whole focus, that this big clash was coming in Jerusalem that would end in his death. So uh, if he was worried about missing Lazarus, well, he was going to see him seven days later. 
reunited in heaven. So, you know, what's the big deal? Why did Jesus weep? He knew they were going to heaven. Not a problem. Why did Jesus weep? I want you to think about it for a few seconds. What do you come up with? Have a think. Any thoughts? I'll see if I can hear you through the mask. Absolutely. He was just showing his human connection to this lovely family that he loved who was suffering. And it's as simple as that. That's what compassion is. It's connection. And lack of compassion is about lack of connection. That's the inverse. But in this case, we see why did Jesus weep? And Mary and Martha were deeply upset. Christ himself knew what Lazarus had gone through with his illness and his death and was soon to know in a very intimate way what Lazarus had gone, to, gone through. And so Jesus wept simply because of connection. It's all about connection. And this is the whole gospel because we begin right at the very very beginning with God creating this world and having connection with human beings in the garden, and the connection is broken. And so what does God start to do from Genesis chapter 12 on? He seeks to restore connection. He seeks to restore this love. And so the whole story working its way through the Old Testament is about God seeking to establish this relationship so that they get to know what God is like so that they can be together a covenant of faithfulness that will last forever. And in Christ, Christ comes building on that first covenant and, and developing it into a new covenant in which God pours out his love into our hearts, forgives our sins, and there is nothing now that can separate us from the love of God. Is that not one of the most beautiful verses in the New Testament? There is nothing that can separate us. Separate. In other words, we are connected. That's the whole gospel. That's, that's the whole point. And so Jesus wept because he was connected. He wept for the, in, in lament with them. He knew there was going to be a happy ending, but that doesn't stop the here and now suffering, does it? So in our church, you know, we've come up with our, our vision statement. Everyone closer to God. It's all about connection. That is the whole gospel that we're trying to say in ways that are, are not too liturgi liturgical or churchy or, or overly academic. Just everyone closer to God, as simple as that. It's, it's about connection. And not only that, but we see that connection is meant to happen both within us. So transformation which means we go from people who couldn't care less about God to people who, are, who love God. We go from people who couldn't care less about other people to people who, who do care about other people. And so we go to serving, which is all about connecting with the suffering of this world and serving people. And it's all fueled by that compassion, that love. See, compassion and love, is the, it's the engine room of Christian faith. And it's either a big, bright, burning furnace or it's a tiny little flicker of flame. And the, the fact of the matter is, in our Christian lives, the flame is always needing to get bigger. The flame of compassion is always needing to grow. And that's what a, a, our Christian walk is all about, as we get to know the Scriptures more, as we get to know Christ more, as we try and change within our walk of faith is a journey of growth, and it's a growth of our compassion and our love, not just of our head knowledge. 
And finally, acceptance is all about acceptance of the huge variety of people that there are in life. And that is about an expansion of connection. So I'm not just connected with the people who are just like me, but I connect with the people who are so very different to me. And I accept them into my love and relationship and connection. And uh, God willing, they accept me into their love and compassion. And church is about acceptance and, and mutual acceptance based upon this love of God. So what is, what is their problem? <laughs> One of the problems we face is hard-heartedness. Hard-hearted. It's a word that pops up in the Old Testament a number of times. And it's, it's about this whole thing of seeing a situation of a person in need or, or a situation that needs addressing or suffering and you harden your heart. You won't let yourself be touched by it. You won't connect with the other person. And it's also revealed in um, the um, New Testament and Jesus' parable of uh, the Good Samaritan by people who walked by on the other side of the road. See, the, the whole parable is about who is my neighbour? In other words, who am I connected with? Who is my neighbour? And so the story goes on to tell about uh, two people who decided they would not connect with the person who was suffering right beside them on the other side of the road. They hardened their heart and walked by. And the, the Samaritan was the one who didn't harden his heart but actually came near. And so that's all about that, that connection and, and being able to uh, say to God, here is my neighbour, my neighbour. And neighbour doesn't just mean physically close to me. It means someone I am connected to. And so in this world of the global village and instantaneous communications around the planet, my neighbour can actually be on the other side of the planet. And uh, we, we experience this in our family because, you know, our our son and daughter-in-law and grandkids are on the other side of the planet and they are near and dear to us. Distance is a nuisance, but it doesn't stop connection and love and compassion. And that's the world we live in. So that I can have deep compassion for the um, uh, four million Syrian refugees who have been refugees for 10 years. I can have compassion or I can harden my heart. So what does... What do we do about hardening the heart? There's this aspect of hardening the heart, which is, um, I just don't want to. <laughs> and I don't want to have compassion. I, I just, it's all too much. Just really, I've got enough problems of my own. Thank you very much. That is the reality of life. And I guarantee every person in this room, including this person, has thought that at some point. It's a reality of being human. Sometimes it's just too much. But other times it's just, I don't want to. I just don't want to. And I think that's part of uh, that as a Christian we've got to deal with in our life. You've got to be able to recognise that when it happens to you. When you see the news or you hear about something, and uh, you realise that, you know, really I should be doing something about it, but I don't want to. You've got to address that because each time we say I don't want to just because I couldn't be bothered or I'm apathetic or uh, I just haven't got the energy for this, it actually, it actually harms yourself as well as the person you're not connecting with. The hardening of the heart. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? We uh, hear various things about hardening of arteries and things like that. Um, and some of you might even know in a more intimate um, way about hardening of arteries. And you know it's not good for your heart, this hardening. And the phrase is indicative. The hardening of the heart is not good for you. It is not good for you. You might think compassion takes a bit of effort, but overcoming hardness of heart takes a bit of effort too. 
And the damage that hardening of heart does is perhaps more long lasting than the effort it takes to get involved, to involve yourself in this world and in its suffering and in its problems. Our temptation to say, I've got enough problems on my own, I haven't got any, any space left in here. Well, that's true sometimes, and I don't want to poo-poo that. It is true sometimes that we have those extreme situations, but most of the time we do have energy. There is space in our heart to open up a bit more because it is our God who works in us to make our heart, to enlarge our hearts, to soften our hearts. The promise in Ezekiel says this. What's happening there? There we go. Hello. The promise in Ezekiel says this, that I will remove their hearts of stone and give them hearts of flesh. That promise in Ezekiel is about what the Messiah will do in our lives. That is God's work, to change our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. And it's all about connection with people. So will you work to help make the world a better place? Will you work to help your neighbour, the, the one next door? Or will you work to uh, overcome um, global warming for the sake of our grandkids, our great-grandkids, for the sake of humanity for generations to come? Will you do that? Well, it all comes down to this. Do I want to or do I not want to? Do I feel, feel the connection? Because our feelings are all to do with our motivation, our desire to get going. And sometimes it requires an act of faith by our head. We know it's the right thing to do, and, um, but we need to address our heart as well. Our prayer should be, teach me, God, to love, really love this person. I won't seek to, to give you all the list of problems that I've just heard in the, the last few weeks. Problems, particularly as we've uh, looked at the International Day of Women, of gender discrimination, of inequity and in pay, of that poor girl Brittany in the politician's office and how her story was suppressed, how she was disencouraged. All of these issues, and then a whole lot of other people coming forward and saying, that's me. And they're wondering, does anyone want to know? Does anyone want to hear? Well, the question is, do you want to know? Do you want to hear? Or is it all too hard? And you don't want to hear. Because bad things will continue to happen unless we hear from those who are silenced. During this last week in Victoria, they started a, um, uh, oh, I should have written down the words, but uh, they're looking into the, the history of Aboriginal people in Victoria and the stories, the untold stories, because we cannot understand who people are now in our relationships now unless we know how we got there. But do we want to hear those stories? They're not nice stories, but they are necessary stories. Do I want to hear what my neighbour has been through? In this, sometimes, I love, I love what uh, Alistair said before, um, which is that, I'll use my own words to phrase it, but anyway, that uh, God loves the oppressor as well as the oppressed. And that God's call for us is not just to love one of those. But what does it mean to love the oppressor? In uh, South Africa, they had a truth and justice um, uh, commission that went around the nation. And people told the stories of what had happened in their lifetime and often to them. 
And the whole point of the commission was not that there be retribution type of justice so that people will be punished for what they did, but reconciliation type of justice so that the community can function again, so that dysfunction will be overcome and people can operate and live together and somehow find a way through. The point of hearing stories of victims and of those who are silenced is to find a way to live together. So when you hear the stories that will come out uh, in the years to come, don't just be angry about the stories or angry about how people have been silenced, but look for ways that we can now live together. What does it mean to be reconciled with First Peoples and Second Peoples in Australia? Hardness of heart says, I don't want to, it's all too hard. But the way of Christ says, well, that's my neighbour. I'm connected to them. I will not harden my heart. I will not pull back my soul from opening up to other people. Today, we've focused on connection and compassion and every one of us here has that as part of who we are. We're all made with this as part of who we are. None of us, without exception, uh, you know, fail to have this as part of our lives. Th this is part of being human. But it's a part we can nourish and grow, even if it's difficult, or we can let atrophy and die. Today, as it says in, the new t in uh, Jeremiah, Choose life. Let us pray. Our God, thank you for all the good things you've done in our lives. You have nurtured us, made us, made us reach out in our best moments to other people, and we celebrate that. And our God, we want to celebrate more. Stretch our hearts more. Grow them more. Get rid of any hardness that you find there and open our hearts to our neighbours. Lord, it is difficult. And sometimes we wonder, with all that suffering, how can we possibly keep looking? And yet you do. You have never turned your eyes from any of us here. You're always looking at us always loving us, always forgiving us and picking us up again. So, Lord, that love that you have shown us, may it fill our hearts and may we reflect that love to others. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Go out with the love of Christ in you, before you and around you, the love of Christ that is for the entire world. And know that as you grow, go, the hand of Christ is in your hand.